Okay, uh, welcome to the second session. Uh, in this session, we'll have three 15 minute talks. Um, are we ready? Okay, the first talk is going to be by uh, Ravi Kumar Sharma. Ravi is at uh, Inst Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And he's going to talk to us about signatures of light massive relics on nonlinear structure formation. So, hello, everyone. Hello. Yes. Hello, everyone. So, today I will talk uh, about uh, LIMRs and their effect on nonlinear structure formation. Uh, to begin with, so this is the density plots of various components of the universe. So as we know that today the universe is dark energy dominated, but at earlier time it was radiation dominated. And at that time neutrinos were uh, occupying a major fraction of that total radiation and hence governing, uh, playing a major role in governing the dynamics of the universe. And even today at late times, uh, the density of the neutrinos is though very less, but it has very unique signatures on the structure formation. And that we will talk in the next few minutes. <coughs> it will change this side or this side? So to go through with some basic neutrino properties. So as we know that neutrinos are massive and they follow the Fermi dark distribution with the temperature that is a less uh, that is less than the photon background temperature. And depending on their mass, they can be either relativistic and they can be might be non-relativistic. And the one special property about neutrinos that even even if they have become non-relativistic, they still have very uh, high velocities, and if from this you can see uh, 0 0.1 electron neut uh, electron volt uh, mass uh, neutrino will have a velocity order of thousand kilometer per second, and this is very high velocity that cannot be neglected in terms of structure formation and ETC. So uh, corresponding to this velocity, we can associate a length scale. So significance of this length scale is that uh, below this length scale, the neutrino will free stream and they will oppose the structure formation. And above this length scale, they will behave like as a, a general dark matter or the standard dark matter. Yeah, so to see the cosmological effect, especially in the context of linear cosmology, uh, the, we def, uh, the, th the effect can be parameterized in terms of three, three parameters, which is its contribution to the relativistic energy density, uh, that is parameter by delta n effective, its contribution to the current energy density and its free streaming. And you can see by the definition, they are nothing but the uh, movements of the distrib phase space distribution, first movement, second movement, third movement. Ideally, in principle, one expect that it will go to, it, it, should, the, it should depend on NF movements, higher movements also, but given the precision of current cosmological observation, these three uh, uh, parameters are NF. And among these three also, only two independent parameters are there. So in context of linear cosmology, the effect of neutrino-like species can be parameterized only two free, by two free parameters, the N effective and MS effective. So today I will not talk about the standard neutrino stuff, rather than I will talk about the known thermal neutrinos. So this is how, uh, if I, there, there is a comparison between known thermal and the thermal one. So the red one is the known thermal, neutrino distribution, you can see that the, the, both the plots, they correspond to the same delta N effective and same M, MS effective. And they look very different. And you can see that the, the standard, the Fermi Dirac one, they, it is localized at a low momentum. However, the non thermal one I, I have a non vanishing tail at higher momentum side. And this will have some interesting signatures in the cosmology. Why we are talking about the non thermal neutrinos? Why not the thermal one? 
So the primary motive, motivation behind the non-thermal uh, sterile species was the asset tension. So asset is a parameter, uh, is a combination of two parameters, sigma 8 and omega m. And sigma 8 is the, I mean, it gives the information about the clustering of the matter. So the Planck measurement of this asset parameter using a lambda CDM model, this gives a slightly higher value of asset. On the other hand, the uh, weak lensing surveys, uh, they, they give a low asset uh, parameter. They infer a low, lower asset value. So there might be a discrepancy or they, there might be a presence of the new species we are missing in the lambda CDM model. Uh, that's why we are getting a slightly higher asset in the lambda CD model. So that's why we are thinking that there might be presence of a non-thermal sterile neutrino. So the other, other question comes in our mind that why not a thermal one? So the a fully thermalized fourth species will contribute to an effective to one. And that is not allowed by uh, earlier cosmological probes like BBN or uh, even the Planck. They are consistent with the N effective is equal to three. They can accommodate a new fully thermalized species. In this non-thermal model, we have freedom because it contributes to delta N effective very less. It, uh, contribution uh, of this non-thermal species is coming to be nearly 0 0.03 or, or order of 0 0.05 maximum. So why it shows the asset tension? So this is the residual of the matter power spectrum with respect to the lambda CDM. And you see there are two kinds of plots, the blue one and the red one. So red one is the corresponding to a standard model and the blue one is the corresponding to the non-thermal. So you see there is a high suppression on the high K side or the small scale there is a suppression in the matter power spectrum. And that's what it solved the asset tension because it is suppressed the, I mean, there is a suppression. It means it suppresses the growth of the perturbation and that's what is solving the asset. In, you see that uh, in the red also there is a suppression, but that suppression is not enough to solve the asset tension fully. So they are the standard neutrinos are on the right track only. They reduce the asset tension, but not fully solving the asset tension. On the other hand, this model is solving the asset tension. So uh, we have taken for our study, we have considered the other well-known uh, well known non thermal models, which are the Dodelson withdraw and the Gaussian one, all three they are corresponding to the same M effective and same delta N effective. And if they look very different, their cosmological signatures should be also very different, right? So, what we found in linear cosmology, this is the residuals of the CMB power spectrum. In linear cosmology, that is blind to uh, all other properties because in linear cosmology, the signatures they overlap to each other. So, the, we cannot distinguish among the all three non-thermal models. And this also sets a, a motivation to uh, do a non-linear analysis, non analysis, analysis to distinguish among the all three uh, non-thermal models. So to do uh, the non-thermal uh, antibody simulation, we have used the gadget code and we have used a one giga parsec box size. So I will skip the details here. So the initial condition of the uh, n-body simulation, they are set by the linear matter power spectrum and the linear growth rate. Okay, okay so in CDM, they, they, have, they are completely set by the power spectrum and the growth rate, uh, but in LIMR component, apart from the gravitation peculiarity, they have very high thermal velocity as well. So the, there are various methods to set the, this velocity assignment. So we are using this particular method to do the assignment of the velocity to LIMRs. So coming to the results, so these are the density contrast of the two components, the CDM plus barium component and non-thermal LIMR component. So in non-thermal LIMR component, the structures are more smeared out or it means the less prominent uh, over densities and less prominent voids. And this is due to because of the free streaming of the non-thermal uh, neutrinos or non-thermal sterile neutrinos. Coming to the matter power spectrum. So there is a maroon curve that is a linear prediction of the matter power spectrum. And the, this one is the uh, output of the n body simulation. So you see that the, this is already the linear prediction. It, it is already different from the linear prediction because this is a better uh, treatment of the predicting the matter power spectrum in the non-linear design of the cosmology. 
the other uh, okay other comparison you see with the, this green one that is the match sigma eight. So this is a lambda CDM model, but the sigma eight of this lambda CDM model is matched to the non thermal model. So the comparison why I am showing this is because in case of standard neutrinos, these both the signals they they are degenerate. It means the uh, effect of neutrino mass is captured by the matching the sigma eight condition, but that is not the case uh, in the non thermal neutrino. So to understand the nonlinear evolution of the uh, halo, so properties of this uh, hello, uh, uh, this density profile is very important. The one such property is the mass concentration relation. And you see that if that the concentration uh, in case of the non thermal LMR, they are suppressed uh, over this mass range. And that suppression is nearly monotonic suppression. And this, in this signal also, the effect is not matched by the match sigma 8. Uh, that is the also contradictory from the standard neutrino case. So why there is a suppression? This can be understood from the power spectrum itself because at, at a small scale, there is a suppression. Yeah. Yes, so there is a suppression in the matter power spectrum. And this, uh, in fact, delays the onset nonlinear evolution. And that's why there, there will be less structures. And if there will be less background density, it means the less uh, uh, concentration will be there. The other thing we, we we went for the weak lensing signal. That is, weak lensing signal is uh, uh, proportional to the excess surface mass density. And we see that there are errors. They are shown with they, they are the errors from the photometric surveys. And we see that in non thermal case, the signal is already out from the error bars. And in future experiments, the error bars will sink more. And this will be I think this will be ruled out in the future uh, photometric surveys. The another important result is that the whatever the all the three models, the Dodelson withdraw Gaussian and the non thermal model, they were same in the in context of linear cosmology. Linear cosmology was unable to see them different. But in non linear signature, we found out that it non linear cosmology, they have different signatures. And it means we, we, we can distinguish among all three non thermal models. And these are my conclusions. Yeah. And I would like to thank my collaborators. Time for a couple of short questions. Any questions? Oh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, did you, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, is that all done with a single simulation for each of the things? Or are you thinking about doing entire ensembles with average order? Can you, for each of your thermal neutrinos, uh, you have one simulation? Yeah, you only one simulation. Yeah. It might be useful to do a few things to get yeah. some of the short noise. Yeah, so, okay, so yeah, the short noise thing, okay, that will contribute for sure, but what we think that this signal is very large, okay, so, I mean, that error bar will be, I mean, comparatively will be less, so that's why we did only one, so that suppression is very too large to be observed. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question. So, you can probably do the same thing with sterile neutrinos, right? Yeah, that's what we did on. It was actually. Ah, okay, yes, yes, yes. No, but sub, uh, okay. Technically, what I'm uh, maybe what I was trying to ask is: suppose you use different models, right? So there's the Shi Fuller uh, model. Dodel cell to actually, if you look at the X-ray constraints, are actually ruled out. So that's why I didn't uh, sort of catch my mind. But Shi Fuller is, I think, probably still allowed as a dark matter candidate. Uh, uh, will that ha have some effect? You know, I'm. I'm not completely aware of this fuller, but is it in the hood? So our argument is that any hot like that comes in the hot thermal dark matter, 
I mean, in the category of whole thermal dark matter, that will have, I, I think that will have the same similar, I, I think similar pattern that will follow the similar pattern. Okay, one last quick question. So, uh, so just to uh, understand the cluster constraint, so you, you, uh, so essentially you have a suppression of the delta sigma throughout the clusters profile, is that right, right? Yeah. Okay, but all, like you can in principle already start putting constraints because you know there are comparisons with CDM of the cluster profile yeah. uh, and how consistent they are uh, with CDM. So in principle, you could try to actually get a constraint on the model as well. Yes. Right. Yeah. Have you tried no, something have, like that? I think we have not tried. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's thank Ravi again. Our next speaker is uh, Richa Arya from IISC, and she'll be talking about primordial black holes and secondary gravitational waves from warm inflation. Yes. Hello. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about my work on primordial black holes and secondary gravitational waves from warm inflation. So uh, this work is, uh, this talk is based on these works, which are done in collaboration with uh, Professor Rajiv Jain at ISC and Arvind Mishra from Iser Pune. Uh, so uh, we know this cosmic inflation is a phase of rapid accelerated expansion in the early universe which was introduced to resolve some shortcomings in the standard Big Bang cosmology. And this phase not only uh, solves those problems, but also provides the seeds of density perturbations for all the structures at the late time. To describe this phase, there are two descriptions. One is the cold description or the standard description in which there is this inflaton field, which drives this inflationary phase and it rolls down this potential. And during this slow roll phase, uh, the universe inflates and uh, the, it attains a supercooled state. Then to bring back temperature and particles in the universe, there is a separate reheating phase after the end of inflation, where this inflaton field oscillates and decays into the fundamental and all the beyond standard model particles. So this is the standard description. And uh, uh, this is the evolution equation of this inflaton field. In contrast to this description, there is another description which is called the warm inflation, in which uh, this inflaton, uh, as it inflates, it also dissipates into the radiation fields. So there is a coupling in the inflaton and radiation fields throughout this inflationary phase. So it's a more general and more uh, natural uh, description. And uh, this uh, dissipative effects arise from all these fundamental principles of a coupled inflaton radiation system. And uh, there is, because of this dissipation, there is a radiation production and there is a finite temperature in the universe throughout the inflationary phase. Therefore, a separate reheating phase at the end of inflation is not necessarily required in this kind of a description. And the evolution of this inflaton field is modified with this additional uh, friction term, which is uh, becoming because of this inflaton couplings with the other fields. And depending on the microphysics of that uh, uh, coupling, 
this this dissipation coefficient is obtained so uh, in this talk we'll be discussing about this description of inflation which is well motivated natural and general and in the limiting case it goes to this cold inflation when this this coefficient goes to zero so uh, as uh, this is a schematic of how the uh, fluctuations generated in inflation evolve so uh, in in the standard inflation we have just the quantum fluctuations but in the warm inflation description we have both quantum as well as thermal uh, fluctuations and uh, as 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 the universe uh, inflates and the co moving horizon shrinks during this inflation era these uh, the wavelengths of these uh, fluctuation modes stretch and at some point cross the horizon and they become super horizon and then they re enter at some later epochs in the universe like in the radiation era or in the matter era so uh, from from the observations of cosmic microwave background we have stringent bounds on the amplitude of these fluctuation these large scale fluctuations at the cmb uh, scales which is constrained uh, to be 10 to power minus 9 however the small scales uh, uh, of of, uh, of of the fluctuations are not well constrained and uh, it is possible that these small scale fluctuations are quite uh, quite over uh, quite uh, over uh, like a uh, large so it can happen that these fl large fluctuations when these re enter in the horizon at later epoch uh, if they have sufficient amplitude they can just collapse into structures some compact objects such as primordial black holes so uh, what are primordial black holes these are the black holes with a primordial origin and because they are formed from the physics of inflation and so therefore they are a unique and uh, a dis a unique probe to the inflationary physics and uh, 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 unlike these astrophysical black holes which are the stellar end products these are uh, formed directly by the collapse of the inflationary perturbations therefore they they span over a wide range of mass uh, given in this plot are the fraction of uh, the density in the form of a primordial black holes at the time of formation which is called the initial mass fraction so all these are the constraints uh, so the regions above this line or uh, color line are excluded and the regions below are uh, allowed uh, from various observations uh this this dashed line shows a mass of 10 to the power 15 grams which is the mass of uh, black holes uh, which have so the black holes which have mass less than 10 to the power 15 grams would have evaporated into hawking radiation by now so uh, their constraints are from their evaporation uh, but the uh, the black holes which are more massive than 10 to the power 15 grams they could be stable and they could contribute as the dark matter so on this in this plot is the contribution of these black holes in the form of dark matter which is denoted by this fraction fpbh so these colored uh, shaded regions are excluded and uh, you can see that in this range of mass of 10 to the power 17 to 10 to the power 23 gram there is a window in which the uh, primordial black hole can constitute the full dark matter abundance so that's why they are very interesting to study so in in our study in this uh, paper uh, we studied this black hole formation from the warm inflationary models so we considered a canonical model of warm inflation with this um, like kinetic minus potential and a potential of lambda phi four and uh, we considered that dissipation coefficient to be proportional to t cube by phi square so we know this lambda phi four in the cold inflation is ruled out in the uh, from the cmb observations but in the warm inflation description we have a parameter space where we can explain these large scale cmb observations for the nsr and also we see that the power spectrum at the very small scales is enhanced to very large values which is required to in order to generate the primordial black holes yeah sure Uh, this one is the last scale which is uh, exiting the horizon during inflation end of inflation yeah that's the last uh, 10 to power 22 uh, mega for 60 efolds of inflation right yeah so uh, we study uh, that uh, we find that uh, in this model we get um, primordial black holes of 
just like uh, 10 to power 3 grams or kilogram mass range uh, black holes. And this is the initial abundance of these black holes. So, but these tiny black holes would have just evaporated uh, into Hawking radiation, but there are theoretical bounds on their, uh, on their abundance from various, uh, uh, from various, uh, like, from their evaporation leading to some uh, LSPs or dark matter kind of particles. So, uh, we find that our model agrees with those bounds. Then uh, there is another proposal that if these black holes uh, evaporate and, and, and and uh, this evaporation stops at some Planck scale. That means uh, this 10 to power three gram um, evaporates and then leaves 10 to power minus five gram relics. So those relics can constitute the full dark matter. So that proposal uh, was proposed in this uh, nature paper. And we find that our, uh, this model can produce uh, this, uh, can satisfy this, uh, uh, this proposal. Uh, next, we study these scalar-induced gravitational waves from this model of warm inflation. So, uh, be, uh, because there are large scalar perturbations uh, required for the PDF generation, so uh, these uh, scalar perturbations can source the second-order tensor perturbations, and that can lead to a spectrum of secondary gravitational waves. And we find that uh, in this model uh, of, of this 10 to power 3 grams PVH, we, we generate a uh, secondary gravitational wave spectrum of this frequency range of uh, one to 10 to power six hertz, which is very high frequency range for, for, uh, for the ongoing or the future detectors. But there are some proposals, uh, very futuristic proposals in which one can probe these regimes. We next study uh, the non-canonical models of warm inflation. So till now we had just this kinetic minus potential in the Lagrangian, but now we add another term, which is a non-linear kinetic term, a Galilean-like non-linear term of this form. And we consider a lambda phi four and a dissipation proportional to T. So we find that the power spectrum uh, is, is red tilted and the NSR are in agreement with the CMB uh, for this model. And uh, also the, at the intermediate scales, the power spectrum is enhanced hugely. And uh, this can lead to PBS production. We also, I'll uh, just mention that this model is also in agreement with the Swampland conjectures, uh, which are some string theory conjectures to uh, embed such models in high energy theory. Uh, okay, so uh, we find that we can generate uh, this window of uh, uh, open window uh, mass range of black holes, which can constitute the full dark matter abundance. Uh, so we see that uh, in this range of uh, mass, 10 to power 15 to 10 to power 20 grams uh, black holes are generated and in, uh, in which include this open window for dark matter. Then we study the sec uh, secondary gravitational wave spectrum and we find that uh, the frequency range of 10 to power minus two to 10 hertz are generated and the spectrum lies in the sensitivity regimes of these experiments, LISA, DECIGO, BBO. So any future detection or non-detection of uh, such GWs can uh, be a test to these inflationary models or basically warm inflationary models. To summarize, uh, warm inflation is a general and a natural, well-motivated description of a coupled inflaton radiation system. And we study canonical, non-canonical models of warm inflation in the context of PBH formation. In the canonical setup, we find that uh, kilogram mass of PVH are generated and a GW frequency over high frequency range are generated. Uh, in the non-canonical model, we uh, generate PVH over a wide mass range, which also includes the range which explains the full dark matter abundance. And the secondary GW spectrum for these kind of uh, black holes uh, lie in the sensitivity regime of future GW experiments, which can be used to test these Warm inflationary models. Thank you for your attention. Uh, time for some short questions. Okay, Tathagata. I have uh, two unrelated questions. So, in the warm inflation model, you showed this uh, this friction term that is proportional to T. So that is dependent on the microscopic physics. So is there any motive? I mean, reason you chose this proportionality or? Yes. So in the first work, we considered like a T cube. Yeah. And in the second, we considered like T. So they have a microphysical 
uh, description how one obtains these tq or t in the canonical setup with with only just uh, t we could not produce pbh so this 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 form of you silence have that flexibility from the microscopic physics yes yes obviously like we do the pheno after uh, choosing a model till that point if the cmb nsr are satisfied as long as it is satisfied it's fine to consider any form another small question for the lisa band you have shown so how precise is the amplitude of this gravitational wave how well it is known of that? our model in general uh, gw coming from tbh right. is there uncertainty in the amplitude calculation of that or uh, you mean in the in the amplitude so there is an amplitude right yes, of yes, 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 in that yes so is there any uncertainty in that calculation or is it uh, can be calculated with some precision from the theory side or so uh, i would not comment on because i'm not an expert on i took this data from uh, gw uh, no no lisa but i understand there must Your be some theoretical calculation in the, so, in the theoretical calculation there is no such because it's just dependent on the power spectrum integrations and mm -hmm. it doesn't have uncertainties in theory okay. in the experimental side it experimental is fine okay okay, okay. thank you uh one uh you mean by the cosmology in the yes yes so yes we assume that this is in the radiation era we assume this is a monochromatic kind of a uh, lots of assumption goes in the theory yes uh hi richa uh, hi uh, uh, thank you for the nice talk uh, i was just wondering means how you have uh, done this analysis for five to the power four potential yeah. so how sensitive it is to the choice of your potential means if i instead consider a five square m square five square potential yeah. will i get this uh, primordial black holes and this uh, same analysis will it be so it's very actually fine tuned with the form of potential with the form of epsilon like uh, dissipation coefficient yeah so uh, there is no direct answer to your question sorry because it has to be worked down and then only one can comment but if if one so first step is to check whether that model is in uh, agreement with the cmb nsr so lambda 54 in our previous study we had already seen that there is a parameter space which agrees with the cmb so we have to make pbh but we also have to to satisfy this this part which is very well constrained m square phi square has a issue there itself so that's why we didn't or or if we can add more free parameters maybe that could also be agreeing with the observations we didn't try that and just uh, another naive question sure. is uh, when we are considering this uh, non canonical models okay. so in non canonical models usually this uh, uh, i know very little about it but uh, this uh, kinetic term it actually gets either squared or um, is yes, either we consider x squared or x to the power 4 or something like this so what you have you haven't uh, mentioned it okay so is uh, to, to the uh, p and q so do you have any specific um, yeah so this model we took p and q as 0 uh, and 1 okay so it's phi x square you have considered x square and non canonical yes x1 sorry q1 x1 so q1 x1 p is 0 and q is 1 so okay. it is phi x phi x. m one M last square. short question hi hi so so when we consider non canonical part so still we have gamma phi dot that is the coupling so that precision is all valid for the non canonical part also uh, that's i want to know so this gamma thing comes in the interaction lagrangian we do yes, not yes. touch that part it is just the uh, inflaton lagrangian which we are tuning hmm. so uh, that upsilon thing the interaction thing is the microphysics whichever uh, way it is going into the radiation okay. that we are not disturbing but the dynamics of this inflaton will be uh, differ uh, differing because of uh, there is additional kind of a non linear friction in this evolution okay so we will still treat that gamma phi dot term that is the same yes but the e equation of motion of this will be changed the coefficient will change because there is this non linear thing Okay. can uh, check in this paper or talk yeah sure sure also follow up questions okay. uh, maybe we can keep that for sure. after the talk thank you uh, so let's thank richa again thank you so much and next we have omlan 
from IIA. Uh, and he'll also tell us about primordial black holes, formation and abundance of late forming primordial black holes as dark matter. So, hello everyone. Uh, today I will be talking about my, uh, one of my work uh, which I have done with Professor Shubhina Dash. Uh, the title of my talk is Formation and Abundances of Late Forming Primordial Black Holes as Dark Matter. So, the content of my talk will be I will first introduce a bit about the concept behind this primordial black hole and how it's a candidate of dark matter. Then I will propose a novel new mechanism for pH formation. And we will see that whether it contributes total dark matter density of our universe or not. Finally, I will conclude it. So as we know in our uh, universe, the dark matter we know is uh, consists of 27% of our total universe. And it is, it is the major component of the total matter density in our universe, whereas the visual matter is only 5%. But uh, so far, there has not been any direct detection of the dark matter, but we have felt its presence through indirect uh, observations like galaxy uh, rotation curves and bullet clusters and all that. I will not go into the detail of those. So in from past, few decades, people have been trying to come up with uh, new candidates of dark matter, which will explain the nature of it. And WIMP had uh, really uh, had give, gave us uh, hope to solve this problem, but a decade of search did not uh, lead to the uh, undetectability of the WIMP. Uh, led the, all the physicists to come up with new candidates and search for it. So one of the candidate, so, uh, so one of the candidate is that whether black holes can be a potentially dark matter candidate. So as we know, Event Horizon Telescope recently took a picture of black holes of the M87 and late latest one is the Sagittarius A star in our Milky Way. So we have a fair amount of idea how black hole works and what is properties and all, but these are all stellar black holes. So stellar black holes cannot be a, a dark matter candidate because they form very much after the CMB and the abundances of the scale, uh, stellar black hole does not uh, match with the abundances of the dark matter we have. But, uh, but contrary to those, the primordial black holes can be a potentially suited dark matter candidate. And uh, we'll see how later. So the, let's talk about the formation mechanism of primordial black hole. So any formation mechanism of primordial black hole or any kind of black hole, you need a collapse. So as we know, CMB has uh, given us the idea that there were inhomogeneities in the early universe. So uh, if there are some mechanism or some way in suppose in the radiation dominated era, because gravity is alone cannot do the collapse uh, by itself. So if there are some extra mechanism that we can incorporate in our theory, then the collapse can happen and can form primordial black holes. So this is one, uh, it's very familiar to you. It's a Richard's paper, I have taken this. So it's a very classic way to form uh, primordial black hole in the inflationary scenario. So we know inflation has this scale invariant power spectrum. 
but at large k values if you induce a very high power then you have at a very small length scale you will have some uh, collapse happening and forming the primordial black holes and it will not even uh, disrupt the cmb power spectrum so it is a very interesting uh, mechanism to form primordial black hole also there is this uh, qcd phase transition where the pressure of the universe drops down and uh, then the gravity wins over and then the collapse happens and produce pgh so now the basic idea behind the product production of pbh and calculating its mass is that you have inhomogeneity uh, all over the horizon and now the horizon is starting to collapse and as it collapses it is safe to assume that the for, uh, formed primordial black hole will have a mass of the approximately of the horizon and if you can see the from this plot that the later they form the higher the mass of the pbh so it is a very interesting point to remember but there is one weak problem for the primordial black holes to be dark matter because they are heavily constrained with a range of masses so uh, there are these evaporation constraints this lensing constraint there is this ligo constraint cmb and accretion and all over the constraints are there and all these shaded regions are excluded and this is the uh, uh, fractional density of primordial black hole over the fractional density of dark matter plotted with against the mass of the primordial black hole but there is still a window left uh, between 10 to the power minus uh, 16 to 10 to the power minus 10 solar mass where the primordial black hole can be uh, a to, uh, total dark matter uh, of our universe so this is a exciting point to work all the models are trying to find a black hole uh, primordial black hole models which are forming within this region so we'll see our whether our models gives this or not so now coming back to our mechanism where we propose the first thing we do we do not touch the inflationary power spectra we keep it as it is and then we consider that there is some beyond standard model interaction is happening between a dark matter fermion and a scalar field and we will see that this interaction will leads to uh, instability in the perturbation of the dark matter fermion and which uh, can somehow uh, leads to the production of pbh so now you can see there is an interesting thing going on so when you have this fermion this shy is the fermion so if you write the conservation equation of the fermion then the coupling term which we have taken it has a interesting property because at very early universe when everything is relativistic then this coupling term will go to zero so you will have no interesting physics no new physics so no production of primordial black hole but as soon as this fermion becomes non relativistic then this coupling will turn on and you will get to see some new physics and as if you uh, calculate all the perturbation equations and all this you will have a uh, delta uh, solution of a exponential one but uh, after the uh, in the harvard group showed that that if you have a, this kind of interaction model between dark matter fermion and scalar field then you will you can show that this uh, square of the sound speed becomes negative so if you put that result in the in delta exponential solution then you will have a positively growing exponential solution which is given by this plot uh, blue line here and then you can have a uh, have a path to pr in producing the primordial black hole but there is a catch that is uh, when the collapse starts this exponential growth is started then after a certain point of time they become a virialized halo so they don't form immediately primordial black hole but after forming this halo they are inside the halo there is scalar field is interacting with the fermion but there can be a scalar bremsstrahlung radiation which is almost similar to like free free radiation of photons from plasma and this radiation can escalate the process towards the formation of primordial black hole like the as the radiation is progressing your collapse time scale is decreasing but the at the same time diffusion time scale gets increased so as a result the radiation scalar radiation gets trapped and you can have a kind of black body situation where the radiation happens only from the surface and as from the surface the radiation is happening you uh, for the the halo is starting to collapse further and further and finally forming a primordial black hole so now the mass of the primordial black hole that is forming in our case we have taken the range of the scalar field to be very very less than the hubble horizon 
So uh, this, because of this uh, very much uh, less than the Hubble horizon, the mass of the black hole that is forming has to be uh, reduced by a factor by the uh, uh, horizon mass. So that factor comes by this m5 by h whole to the power minus three. So in our case, we consider PBH yeah. uh, at, uh, uh, at the formation time. So, uh, so this is when the temperature is uh, one kV. So it, in our case, we are taking this kind. This is the, our parameter space. So we are taking this 10 to the power minus 25. Uh, thing. So uh, because at that time, the PVH is forming. So we have to take at that point. So now we, we have got this parameter space where we have taken these kind of uh, numbers. And now the ma main concept is that there are two different types of PBH formation mechanism. One is monochromatic PBH, where the, all the PBH that are forming in our universe have the same mass and of the order of horizon mass. But there is another thing which is much more realistic, that is the non-monochromatic PBH, where the, all the PBH that are forming have a distribution of mass and where the some of the mass can be very, very much lower than the horizon mass. So this uh, scenario we have taken into account in our case, where we have, we have seen that it is very realistic because since the formation of PVH is a gravitationally collapsed uh, formation, so statistical mechanics can point out that critical phenomena is happening. So you will get a kind of scaling relation that uh, given by this chop peak by in 1993. So we have used this kind of equation where you can, it is clearly indicating that the mass forming can be less than the horizon mass. And so we have incorporated this in our calculation and this is a well, standard procedure of the calculation, calculating the power spectrum. Okay, so uh, power spectrum. So anyway, so uh, you can get this kind of standard mass function you can use using pressure theory. And then uh, the, after calculating the mass function, there is a catch because you have to consider two things. One is that the when the uh, collapse is happening, it is not of the horizon mass. So you have to incorporate the uh, factor in the mass itself in the uh, mass function. And also within the actual horizon, there will be a lot of number of patches, this kind of patches. So which will be forming primordial black holes. So you have to take into account the number of patches. So after uh, correcting all those factors here, we finally get the uh, mass function. And then we plotted with the uh, recent constraint plots all over the place. And we found that the, this late forming privilege actually forming around 10 to the power six red chip. And it is already contributing totally to the dark matter. And uh, the, uh, these are the, my uh, different parameter uh, numbers. And so now the future prospect is that in, uh, it, we have to detect this kind of PVH, otherwise there is no point. So advanced LIGO and LIDA can have a chance of detecting them because uh, they can go into mergers and you can detect those gravitational waves. Uh, some of them Rija talked about. And also the PBH constraint that I have shown here has to be taken as a magnitude, uh, magnitude estimate because future experiment will give us more robust bounds on this. And also the PBH, we have to calculate the spins of the PBH because I have not calculated the spins or taken into account in this. So spins can be a really interesting point and play a role in the detection of uh, future detection of PBH. So this is my conclusion. So here we have presented a novel mechanism where PBH is forming around 10 to the power six uh, redshift and where we can consider, we didn't change the inflationary spectrum. We take a, take a scenario where uh, fermions are interacting with the scalar field and we have seen that it is uh, non-relativistic fermion leads to a, a exponentially growing uh, perturbation and which is now through scalar radiation forms PBH and PBH mass we get within the range of 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 14 solar mass, which contributes to the total dark matter density of our universe. And so, and uh, future detection will unravel more about PBH. So future is in exciting. So thank you. Omla. Sorry, I missed what you said about the, the scalar that you're coupling to. What do you have to assume about the, the energy density in the scalar or 
what about its potential or its initial conditions? Uh, to uh, in this point of scalar, you uh, actually you have to take into the mass into account because mass is very important factor as I showed because uh, that de determines the range on which you will be operating. So that mass is uh, there. So but in the scalar mass, there is not much more constraints from the observation. So we have a little bit free parameters on that side. So does the scalar contribute to either the dark matter density or the dark energy density? Yes, because uh, this model actually shows that uh, it can lead to an early dark energy phase. So that early dark energy phase can, uh, I mean, you can, uh, there is one paper uh, so that showed that this can this scenario can lead to early dark energy phase. But it also shows the point that uh, there will be an instability. So that instability will lead to, uh, I mean, the disruption of the early dark energy phase. So it's kind of a complete model. So it has a, so that is the thing. Uh, I had a doubt. Uh, why did you feel the need to include uh, patches inside a single primordial black hole uh, diagram because instead of our uh, scalar field uh, range is not of the Hubble horizon. So at certain times, uh, snapshot, if you take the snapshot of the universe, there will be some multiple patches of the uh, ranges because you don't have the total Hubble horizon, right? So you are taking a smaller patch of the Hubble horizon. So there will be multiple patches of the horizon. So you have to take into account because all of the patches will collapse and form the PBH. So you have to take into account the number of PBH that are forming at certain time. So at a particular time, when we are taking into account the number of PBS that will uh, have to go into the calculation of this mass function. This is the. Uh, so why couldn't you take just a single patch and uh, work on? Because it? that will not give you the correct answer, right? Because at a suppose uh, when uh, suppose when the PBS is forming, then it is acting like a matter, and before that it was acting like kind of a radiation because there is interaction was going on. So when they are acting like a matter, so you can show that as time will progress, uh, the nature of the mass function will retain the sim uh, similar form. So now if you don't take into account the number of patches, then you will have at a time, each time left, you will have uh, only one, you will only consider this one patch, but uh, there will be multiple number of primordial black holes that are forming. So you will miss out those numbers and that will mess with your I mean, results. So you have to take into account, right? Okay. Okay, so I believe this is potential at the background is like this typical mass firing neutrino type yeah, of yeah, story. Yeah. But then what is the masses of those fermions that you assume? I mean, following up probably the- Yeah, so-, so There are two uh, scale, maybe one is the scalar mass and maybe one is the fermion mass. So fermion mass doesn't play any role? Yes, yes, fermion mass- but Where is, is it playing? Uh, so, uh, so, uh, the, the play main playing role is this uh, adiabatic sound speed that is uh, becoming negative because uh, this kind of interaction where mass bearing neutrino kind of uh, scenario you will no, but, take. But in the end, you're calculating this omega dark matter or something. Yes, yes, yes. But, but there is Fermion mass never sets any skill. Into the no, 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 Fermion mass is coming here. Okay, wait. Yeah, coming here. This, this, the, this plot you see, Mm -hmm. So there is this uh, scalar field mass and this is the temperature. This temperature actually comes from the fermion. So we take the temperature of the fermion as the universe temperature. And then we uh, plot, this, plot uh, this kind of plot. So because we have to take it like this because the coupling turns on after the fermion becomes non-relativistic. So uh, that's why we take this temperature as a parameter for the fermion. So when they become non-relativistic, then all this formalism is valid. Otherwise, there will be no formalism. Okay, maybe I'll... Okay. Okay, uh, let's thank... Uh, maybe we can do this afterwards. Uh, so let's thank Omlan and all the other speakers in this session. And carry over questions you can ask at lunch. Uh, we'll reconvene for the discussion at 2.30, okay? So.